This is a reproduction of uh, the first lecture given by Olofsson at the Wolf workshop in the Seychelles. And this lecture is uh, made of a lot of material from Wallace and Hobbes, their textbook, the textbook by Einarsson, and material from, from Haldor Björsson, Halfton Augustsson, Olaver Rögvaldsson, Nina Petersen, and myself. Now, this is to remind us that uh, the mass of the atmosphere is very, very little compared to the mass of the Earth, and the atmosphere is indeed thin, uh, and this lecture will be basically about the vertical structure of the atmosphere and uh, the composition, the chemical composition of it. Now, uh, I will spend some minutes on explaining the equations that govern uh, the motions in the atmosphere, and... Uh, the reminder of the talk will be on the energy balance, uh, the radiation balance and heat transport uh, uh, on a global scale. And then I'll end by some, with some discussion on the uh, atmospheric boundary layer. Now, <clears throat> this is how the profile of the atmosphere looks like. Above, uh, uh, below about five kilometers, we have about 50% of the mass of the atmosphere and below about 20 kilometers we have about 95% of the atmosphere. In uh, the lowest part of the atmosphere, the so-called troposphere, uh, the temperature decreases regularly and the troposphere is capped by an inversion uh, above which the temperature increases. Again, now... <clears throat> Uh, the uh, the troposphere is typically about 10 to 15 kilometers. It can be lower, it can be higher. And uh, it is usually uh, considered to consist of a so-called free atmosphere where surface friction is not important and the so-called boundary layer, which is the lowest part of the atmosphere, the part of the atmosphere that, that is in, in constant con uh, contact with uh, surface of the earth. In fact, we define the boundary layer very often as, as the layer of the atmosphere that feels different changes in the, in the quality of the surface of the earth or the conditions at the surface within less than an hour or so. Now, <clears throat> the boundary layer is certainly not always well defined, but if it is defined, it is defined by an inversion, the so-called capping inversion. And uh, this inversion may range from being at, at a level of several kilometers and, and down to only a few dozen, a few tens of meters. <clears throat> now, here we have uh, another figure of more or less the same, same thing here. We have in, in, the, in the free atmosphere, we have very little effect of surface friction. Uh, and at the bottom, we have the we have the boundary layer, and in case of, of strong convection, the boundary layer may reach all the way up to the tropopause. And now, if we take another look at the vertical structure of the atmosphere, uh, the troposphere is the lowest part of it, with by far the most of the mass. And it's in here we have that we have the uh, what we call weather. However, this part of the atmosphere, the stratosphere, is of uh, great interest as we have in recent years discovered that uh, changes in the flow patterns in the troposphere, they often start by changes at higher levels in the atmosphere. A few words about the composition of the atmosphere. Uh, most of it is nitrogen and a lot of 20% is oxygen. Uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, gases which are in, in very small concentrations, uh, but these gases that I mentioned here are important because they, are, uh, they uh, have a great impact on the radiation balance of the Earth and consequently they impact the heat, the temperature of the atmosphere. Uh, uh, the water vapour is, is an important uh, uh, greenhouse gas. However, it, it doesn't last very long in the atmosphere. And then we have other gases which are well known from the everyday discussion on, on climate change, such as carbon dioxide and methane. 
Uh, lifetime of gases is very, very different. The water vapor lasts only for days or weeks, while other gases, uh, like the normal gases, they can last for a very long time. And now, <clears throat> I'll say a few words about the the uh, the wind patterns the, uh, of the uh, on a global scale. And this is, of course, um, a great simplification of. Uh, the uh, the patterns of of the Earth, but we'll go through that nonetheless. We do have close to the equator the so-called convergence zone, where there is a, a substantial vertical uh, lifting. This lifting of the uh, of the air masses and consequently a lot of precipitation. And this uh, intertropic convergence zone is is where the northeast trade winds meet the southeast trade winds, like that. Now, on each side of the trade wind belt, we have the subtropical highs with uh, very little clouds descending motion and uh, uh, at higher latitudes uh, to the north of the, the subtropical high in the north and to the south of the subtropical high in the south. We have uh, a band of um, dominating westerly winds uh, with um, typically with uh, subtropical uh, with uh, extratropical cyclones, uh, fronts, and that kind of features. Now, <clears throat> to give you some humorous, interesting stati statistics, uh, we know that about one breath of air is about 10 in the power of 22 molecules, uh, which actually happens to be uh, the same similar order of magnitude as the number of uh, the alleged number of stars in the universe, um, and uh, the entire at, uh, atmosphere contains about ten to the power of twenty forty four molecules, uh, which makes ten to the power of twenty two breaths of air. So, uh, of course, eventually, uh, <coughs> each breath of air is going to mix with with other. Um, and uh, this is to remind us that the atmosphere is indeed a shared resource. Before we go to the uh, equations of the atmosphere, uh, we need to uh, say a few words about the atmospheric pressure. Uh, the atmospheric pressure is a fundamental uh, variable uh, describing the, uh, the atmosphere. Uh, it is basically a measure of the weight of the uh, air column above the pla ab above where you measure the pressure. So if you have a lot of air and dense air, you have high pressure. Dense means, means generally cold. Now, here I present you the uh, so-called primitive equations that describe uh, the uh, atmosphere. And these are basically the equations that are being integrated in not only the Wolf model, but all the other atmospheric models. Uh, the first three equations, they are basically just uh, Newton's second law. We have uh, uh, these, this is the, um, the acceleration term in time and in space. And uh, uh, we have the pressure gradient forces. And we have frictional forces and the Coriolis force. These are the three directions. These three equations, they have um, nonlinear terms, uh, which uh, make them difficult to, to solve. And uh, in fact, we don't have any, any analytic solution of these equations yet. There are more equations. We have... Uh, conservation of heat and we consider that the mass is conserved as well and, um, and we have uh, the thermodynamic equation of state and conservations of water vapor or water in the atmosphere. Rather simple. Uh, now we take a look at the energy balance of the Earth. Uh, there is uh, incoming shortwave radiation of about 1,372 watts per square meter. 
And uh, we have to keep in mind that uh, the rotational axis of the Earth is tilted. Uh, it's tilted like this and like this. It varies depending on the season, and this is why we get the seasons. And the atmosphere, the, the atmosphere is heated as well as the surface of the Earth by the radiation. And this is how uh, the uh, budget of the incoming radiation looks like. Uh, about 50% percent, percent of the incoming radiation is absorbed by the surface of the Earth, while uh, as much as 19% is absorbed by the atmosphere itself and by clouds. Now, the rest is basically scattered, it's, it's reflected, uh, most of it is reflected by the clouds. And uh, the clouds reflect a lot because they're white, and uh, we see from this figure that uh, the reflection of solar radiation is highly dependent upon the quality of the surface. Clouds and fresh snow they may reflect as much as more than 90% of the incoming radiation, while dark bodies like concrete may absorb more than 90% of the radiation. And this is how the albedo of the, of the land masses of the Earth look, Earth look like. We have high albedo. Albedo is the percentage, is, is the reflection indicator. Uh, <coughs> we have... Uh, about 40% reflection up in, in, in the north where there's much snow and the sand actually reflects a lot uh, and we see that uh, the conifer forest uh, at the edge of the, uh, of the, the tundra area is uh, absorbing uh, quite a lot as we see here as well, the dark forest much more than the grassland further south uh, <coughs> Now, not surprisingly, the Earth absorbs much, much more uh, at low latitudes than it does towards the poles. Um, however, the, uh, the so-called terrestrial radiation map looks quite different. Terrestrial radiation is the radiation that is emitted by the, the Earth. Uh, uh, the radiation is a function of temperature. Uh, the warmer the body is, the greater is the outgoing radiation. And one would perhaps think that uh, the terrestrial radiation was at maximum close to equator, but that's not the case. We have uh, maximum uh, outgoing radiation, uh, terrestrial radiation, in the subtropical heights uh, and not at the equator. And this is basically because the, the emitting body is the surface of the Earth, where, th where we don't have any clouds, and the surface of the Earth is, is definitely uh, warmer here in the subtropics than um, the surface, emitting surface is warmer here than, than close to the intertropical convergence zone, where the emitting surface is top of the clouds, typically at 10 to 15 kilometers. Uh, now, <clears throat> This gives us a net radiation map that looks like this. There's a gain uh, at low latitudes, a loss at the uh, uh, high latitudes, and uh, we are close to zero in the subtropical deserts. And the same information is given by this graph, showing us that we are in surplus at low latitudes and in deficit towards, as we go towards the poles. And consequently, to keep the balance, we must uh, have transport of heat away from the tropics to high latitudes. And this transport of heat goes uh, uh, through the atmosphere. The atmosphere brings uh, the heat to low to high latitudes and the ocean as well. Now, <clears throat> The uh, transport of heat in the atmosphere can be split into a latent heat transport and transport of sensible heat. And they, in fact, do not look quite alike. They are positive uh, in the westerlies, but as we go into the trade winds to close to uh, equator, we get 
uh, a transport of uh, uh, latent heat going towards uh, the intertropical convergence zone from from north to south in the northern hemisphere while the the transport of sensible heat goes in the opposite direction and what's happening here is that the trade winds actually bring water vapor at low levels into the convergence zone where we have uh, lifting and much precipitation <clears throat> now in this context we should mention the cells uh, that are that are let's shall we say uh, derived by integrating the movements in the atmosphere in time uh, this does not imply constant winds but transport of mass and uh, we have upward motion uh, here in the tropics and lots of precipitation and downward motion in the subtropical high and very little clouds and this yields uh, um, circulation like that uh, this is called the Hadley cell and uh, we have a similar circulation here in the in the westerly called westerly is called the feral cell and uh, <clears throat> we'll end this introduction by looking at the development of the uh, boundary layer which is typically uh, one to two kilometers one to three kilometers um, and now in the daytime uh, where the sun is, is is heating the surface we have a very hot surface layer which is super adiabatic above which the surface layer is maybe typically uh, 50 100 meters above the surface layer we have well mixed a boundary layer with constant potential temperature and above uh, the mixed layer we have the capping, uh, the capping inversion and we have the free atmosphere the water vapor is well mixed inside the boundary layer except here in the surface layer we ha where we have the evaporation taking place and we have more more uh, water vapor the, sur uh, the fr uh, surface friction is working inside the the boundary layer where the, uh, the air mass is mixed up here we have the free atmosphere and no friction or very little friction and the wind speed is greater than below and in the surface layer we have typically the um, logarithmic wind profile during night time we get an inversion at the surface of the earth and uh, uh, Consequently, uh, the frictional effect does not as easily reach up to the so-called residual layer, which used to be the mixed layer during daytime. And we typically have a nocturnal jet uh, above uh, the surface layer. This concludes the introductory talk uh, by Olafsson at the Seychelles.